located approximately 75 feet from the roadway. The mowing crew contacted the Lindale Police Department, who then contacted the Sheriff's Office, where Detective Turner uh, got involved. The remains appeared to be of a female from the clothing that was found near the body. A lady's t-shirt was found with an insignia on the front, which read Top Rail Country Music Dallas State. to identify the young female and I'll go ahead and tell you I don't have it written down here but it's because of the tenacity of this man right here is the reason she has been identified in 2021 the sheriff's office partnered with DNA Doe project for assistance in identifying the remains the DNA Doe project is a nonprofit organization that assists law enforcement agencies in identification identification of unknown remains through D DNA ancestry searches. A grant was obtained in late 2021 with Astria Labs in California to extract DNA from the remains for ancestry comparisons. Through DNA received, the DDP submitted the results through several ancestry data banks. In November 2023, the DDP notified Detective Turner of the results of the ancestry search and a possible lead identifying the remains as a white female from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Information also found the victim was married in January of 1984 and she had uh, a child born in July of 1984. Detective Turner here spoke with possible family members and traveled to Fort Worth and obtained DNA swabs from the possible mother of the victim. Detective Turner also verified the victim had told other family members she did have a daughter believed to have been born in July of 1984. Detective Turner located the da daughter living in Alabama and with the assistance of the Fort Payne Police Department, DNA was obtained from the daughter. All samples were submitted to the University of North Texas at Fort Worth Anthropology Department for comparison of, of, to the victim. Our office was notified earlier this month from UNT Fort Worth the victim's DNA was a positive match to the mother in Fort Worth as well as the daughter in Alabama. The remains were identified as Cindy Gina Crow, a white female with a date of birth of September 12, 1957. The last address in 1984 was in Arlington, Texas. She married Dwight P. Crow in 19 January of 84. The daughter of the victim was identified as Marja Margot Marie Crow Gomez. Family members have been notified of the DNA match and the identity of the remains as being their family members. And we'll take any questions at this time. the body and if at all possible try to determine what caused the death and which will be the next part if it's been so old so long ago it's gonna be very difficult also when you don't have any organs or anything left in the body you have nothing but skeletal remains it's very difficult unless you have a shattered skull or or something very prominent to, to show the cause of death so uh, the family is glad to find uh, some closure in it, I, I'm sure. And again, I can tell you, he has been after me forever for the last several years. Uh, ever since I've been here, I've been here going on 12 years. Uh, Sheriff, I need some more money. I, I need another grant. I need this or that to further pursue to try to get the remains identified. And the next step for us to do, uh, we, we feel, it's, feel that it's our obligation to make sure she gets a proper burial. Yeah, for Ms. Crow, um, 
listed as a missing person at this point? It's very hard to tell since we just found out and you have to go back 25 years and everything gets purged or, or gets put in uh, boxes and put in a warehouse. Uh, you know, that many years ago, they didn't even have really good databases uh, in, as far as law enforcement reporting and things of that nature. So uh, that part would be very difficult. It, it, it appears, uh, I'm, I hope I'm not making too big a stretch, that the family was not that close like some families are and uh, there's a lot of traveling and wandering uh, during that time that uh, I believe she was, what, 26, 27, 28 at the time she went missing. Uh, and she, had, uh, I don't even know if uh, David's had an opportunity yet uh, to try to locate the husband or ex-husband or whatever. He's deceased. He's deceased, so. A lot, lot of uh, answers have gone to the grave. Uh, with her and him and, and other people. The daughter obviously would have been too young to have known anything. So the mother, uh, she was already out of the house. So uh, it, had we had missing reports, it would have made it much easier for us to try to get her identified. Uh, but uh, that's why it's always important when you have a missing person to don't let NCIC, TCIC remove that from the database where when we find remains, we can go back and, and uh, check the closest ones to us and then go, uh, venture farther out to try to identify the, the remains. There's none here. We don't have any unidentified right. remains. Right. Uh, but if we have we have a couple along with Tyler PD, National Tyler PD has one too that I kind of do searches on all the time through NEMAS, which is National uh, Data Bank for Missing Persons, and I'll do searches through them to see if it will uh, possibly have a lead. I'll go one step farther. Uh, when I came into office in you know, January 1st, 2013, we had 24 unsolved homicides. We solved two of those. We solved one that occurred in Fort Worth that, uh, through here. And since that date, uh, since January 1st, 2013, we've had zero unsolved homicides in Smith County, and from which is almost unheard of. Well, uh, we feel proud that, that we finally stuck with it long enough to get an answer, but I had no doubt uh, David did all this mostly on unpaid time. Uh, he was a reserve deputy. I hired him back when I went into office in January 1st, 2013, but David had worked here. When I worked at Gregg County Sheriff's Office from 76 to 87, and he worked over here, we'd worked together some. Then I went to DEA in Denver, and then full circle back to Tyler with ATF and then I, we kind of got back together and but uh, we need some more people like him. Yeah, David, having been involved in this case for almost 39 years, years. what is it like to finally identify the pro? Well, it, you know, with any case that we solve, whether it's a recent case or an old case, we're always proud of ourselves and glad that we did it. This case here is, it was always kind of a, a, a challenge because, uh, not to correct the sheriff, but she was never reported missing. Her family lived out of state. She wound up back here in Texas, and she just was around everywhere. So, uh, actually, her family never knew that she was even married or had a child. Mm -hmm. So... Through, and if with the, with the the investigative part that the, the DNA Doe project did that Rhonda and them did, I followed up on all their leads and learned learned more than what we walked off with. Yeah. And, and we want to let Rhonda have an opportunity to speak here today. Rhonda Kevorkian, uh, no relation to Dr. Kevorkian. Uh, so Rhonda, if you would please come here. I want to show something. Okay. 
He wants to show you something first. Yeah. Now, we didn't rehearse this. We didn't rehearse this. We've been around a long time. This is a... Uh, That's me. I had black hair then. That's Tommy Goodman. Uh, he works here now. Did they have Photoshop back in those days? They sure did. And this is uh, Kelly Stroud. He was another one of our detectives. This is the next day after we uh, found the remains and we went back up there with uh, metal detectors and a shovel. And our, we had a so sift. Back then, you had a shift, a sifting screen. You know, you put dirt up there and sift it. We found additional bones. Found several items, so uh, uh, I just kept this. I ran across this in the newspaper while I was looking up looking up ads. Uh, I got two more I want to show you, but I'm gonna let Rhonda speak first, and then I and tell tell how we did this, and I'll show you those. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here today. I'm Rhonda Kavorkian, Executive Director of Human Resources and Education for the DNA Doe Project and Team Lead for this case. I'm honored to be here alongside the Smith County Sheriff's Department to share this important update with you. For those who may not be familiar with our organization, the DNA Doe Project is a national nonprofit that works exclusively on cases of un unidentified remains. Our expert investigative genetic genealogists volunteer their time and expertise to help bring resolution to these difficult cases. The investigative lead that was provided to the Smith County Sheriff's Department aided in the identification through a process called investigative genetic genealogy. Through this process, our team was able to build the family trees of matching DNA relatives. Common ancestors were found amongst them, suggesting that these ancestors were also in the tree of our unidentified person. We then built forward in time to look for anyone that was unaccounted for. This painstaking work carried out by a team of our 15, 15 of our volunteers who traveled to Texas to work in a retreat style event has led us to this investigative lead. A close relative was on this match list, saving the team hours of work and pointing us in the, to the correct candidate in a matter of hours. I want to thank the Smith County Sheriff's Department and investigator David Turner for allowing us to partner with them on this case. Thank you, David and Betty Edwards, for never giving up on her. I'd also like to acknowledge the crucial contri contributions of our co-team lead, Robin Espenson, the entire DNA Doe Project team, and all those who worked behind the scenes to support us including Estrella Forensics, who did the extraction and whole genome sequencing, and Kevin Lord of Saber Investigations for performing the bioinformatics. Additionally, we are deeply grateful to Ruth Foreman for her hospitality and for providing a warm and welcoming space for our team to work. Our team wishes to express our deepest condolences to Cindy's family and loved ones, we know this is a bittersweet resolution, and our hearts go out to all who grieve for loss. Thank you. Um, I just have one quick question. So there yes. was, so during the project, you guys had DNA of Cindy, and that's how you guys kind of went through the tree? Well, the DNA goes to the lab, gets processed, and then it goes to Kevin Lord, who does the bioinformatics. That's where he creates a usable kit for upload, then it's uploaded to GEDmatch. And that's the database that we used in this case. But the DNA was from Cindy. It was from. Uh, well, yes. What what we do is the, the DNA we had from Cindy was actually we, was in CODIS. I sent some of the remains to Australia Labs. They ex extracted the DNA that was necessary for the ancestry part. It takes a whole lot more for the ancestry DNA than it does for criminal DNA type thing. So through that, and thank goodness that the first cousin had, did a, a genealogy search on herself, so when when we uploaded the DNA from Australia Labs, or they, they then it spit out through the Ancestry data bank, the first cousin. After my search and, and investigating with them, and I got swabs from the mother 
and from the daughter, then that's ran through CODIS, and then CODIS says, yes, it's a match. So that's basically how we come up with identifier. And so and while we're on that, uh, the DNA dough people have a, like a forensic artist, I guess. Yes. So he had taken some, uh, uh, actually the original photos that I gave him from the, uh, uh, that uh, Swifts did during the original autopsy. And this is the, this is what they came out, he came up with, this is what he believes she looked like. Well, oh, don't stand up, I'm sorry. And that's, that's what, and we also learned that she, he, she was part Hispanic and part Italian, is what we also learned. But that's what he drew. And this is her high school picture. So you can see pretty well, uh, he's pretty sharp in, on, the, on, on the, the reconstruction. So, but she was, as he said, 26, 27 years old when she disappeared. So. Any other questions? You brought up sifting through evidence on the scene and things like that. Can you sort of speak to uh, the evolution of the technology and what the future for identifying victims looks like? They still use sifters. They, they still, <laughs> I was going to say, they still use sifters. I'm sorry. Yes, they still use sifters. Uh, I don't know if, if, I've not been onto a crime scene in, for, in, for years now with, these, with our crime, because before we had to do it. Mm -hmm. We worked our own cases. Now we have our own CSI unit. They go out there, they do the scene, and we don't go in there. You know, we let them do everything. So, uh, but yet we actually found a, uh, through the sifting and with, with uh, Tommy with using the uh, metal detector, we found her watch and an earring. So that, uh, and this was in an area that was, it was in a kind of a, a gully and she'd been there for a year, and and it rained, and so most of all this stuff was under four, five, six inches of mud. So even the bones. So we, that's why we went back out there the next day and searched more and opened our grid up to to get a bigger area and to find. Hope we wanted to find all of her bones. That's the main thing we wanted to do. Were you able to do that? Yes, ninety-nine percent of them we did. Team. Which is almost unheard of in a situation like that where they've been there a year because of animals, especially around East Texas, wild hogs and, and then stray dogs and everything. I've, I've seen them where they're scattered all over the forest. So. Yeah, so at the time, y'all were unable to identify her due to limitations in technology? We, there was no ID on her, no missing report on her. We couldn't, you know, I've done searches through NamUs over the last 38 years trying to uh, identify her. And I get, I've always gotten hits as far as people that, that matched ours. And uh, one's actually from uh, out of Louisville that's missing. We, I tracked the parents down, got DNA, and submitted it. it they're not, it's not them. Another one from uh, Florida and uh, got a hold of her dad, the, the victim's daddy. He is 90 years old, still alive. Got DNA from him. We compared him, and he actually said that that his they were from around Orlando. And he said that she hitchhiked all the time, and they always felt like uh, Ted Bundy got her, picked her up hitchhiking. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, but trust me, I cannot thank the DNA Doe Project enough. Because <laughs> we would have never identified unless we had done this ancestry thing. And Betty Edwards actually has a Facebook page for uh, Tyler Jane Doe that we've followed for years on there, you know, and talked back and forth for everything, trying to, you know, following up leads. She'd call me and say, check this girl. I'd, I'd check, you know. But if they, and I'd call the department, and if they had the DNA in there, in the, in the, to the, this, in NamUs, well, it's been checked, you know. I know you said, you know, it's obviously very difficult here, you know, for the next stage of things, but now that she's been identified, kind of where do you guys go now from, you know, here with the case? 
it's very difficult now. To, that, that's just a whole other stage we're going to have to uh, evaluate uh, because the only living relatives I think that we have is the mom is still living right there. Mom, she is. But the oh, yeah. daughter obviously was too young back then. Uh, she was an infant. Uh, or not very old. Yeah, she's got about a month or two old. Yeah, so very difficult to go any further. And all we have to show, quite frankly, that it was a homicide if we were to arrest somebody is because her clothes were piled next to her and she was unclothed. Uh, I wasn't there. Uh, I was working somewhere else then, so I, I, I can't speak to the scene uh, where they were like just laying there all together or... Uh, obviously, it would look completely differently had animals uh, torn them off or whatever, and, and I'm, I'm assuming from what I've heard that that was not the case. How did the, the partnership with DNA Doe Project in 21, how did it go from where it was to, uh, you know, entering into a partnership? Well, I say uh, we partnered with them. Uh, Greg County had two unidentified uh, females over there. And uh, Lieutenant Eddie Hope, uh, who was one of the officers then, he had contacted the DNA Doe Project and Kevin Lord. And I've had multiple conversations with Kevin also. And talking to, to Eddie and him telling me, yeah, you need to do this. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right. So I said, went to the sheriff and said, you know, hey, let's, let's do this. So he said, we need to do it. So we did. So that's how we wound up uh, getting Kevin and and starting the process and getting with Australia Labs. They gave us, they actually gave us a grant. They didn't charge us nothing to do this, which is four or $5,000 to, to do this extraction, uh, you know. And, and they have to have such a high quantity that, that they, uh, uh, it, it took them about a year and a half or more to, to, uh, to do all the, the DNA that they need to get. You said a high quantity of a sample? Yes. Okay. And, and like I said, Rhonda may could tell you more about that than I can. I, you know, so, but I, uh, uh, but after, <laughs> after we got the results back and, and they got them submitted through the, through the uh, uh, GED match, it was pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And the blessing of it, of it was that the results came back fast and if that, first cousin and and when I tried to get a hold of the first cousin I actually wound up with her uncle and I asked him you know, do you have a family member that disappeared? He said yeah my sister's child disappeared in 84 bingo well I say disappeared in 84 that's the last contact they had with her was 1984 and both uh, Swifts and UNT uh, anthropology folks up in Denton both said that uh they judged she had been out there in for about a year or so. So we found her October 1st, 1985. That's probably right on the button, uh, uh, somewhere around the August time frame. Now, Sheriff Smith spoke about your tenacity. Where does that drive come from? Being old police. Mm -hmm. uh, being, being uh, uh, you know, he made a statement one time, which is true, and we've been there together. We start something, we don't finish until it's, till it's done. You know, come 5 o'clock, we don't stop. We keep on going. It might be midnight or 2 or 3 o'clock. We were doing the verse 48 before that show was ever yeah. dream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'd yeah. go home, we would work until we identified the last person the deceased decedent was seen with plus the uh, who, who the person was. Uh, we, we've been doing that for years. It was nothing to work 48 or more hours, round, round no clock. sleep. Nothing, and that, that's what I attribute to our 100% clearance rate. You have a window of opportunity when you're working a homicide case, and the way I try to show it is the wind is moving. If you don't jump through the window early, it's gone, and it takes 10 times as much time and leg work and everything to get what you would have gotten immediately had you not worried about too much overtime, too much comp time. You, you can't think about things like that. And the longer you go, the the witnesses disappear. The, it, it, you Prime do, example in this case here. Yeah, I read right now. They just and it, actually a lot of the stuff that I found out, a lot of the information that I found out too, was from 
a cousin, I think it would be her cousin, uh, of the child in Alabama that was 11 years old when they showed up in Alabama with the, with the daughter. So uh, he, she provided me with a lot of information, but everybody else is deceased. So just have to, you know, go with what we got. Yes. I, I mean, I've always said before, I uh, pass through the gates. I'm on to a gentle fire. So, feels good. You know. but see, thank goodness for uh, the, the DNA Dope Project. I keep on saying, you can't, I can't thank them enough. You know. 